Hi, welcome to Make or Repair, and today I'm going to start working on this device. So you may have seen this on the mailbag. This is a Photodyne model 1975XQ optical attenuator. Now this is partly a repair video, but in fact, as we'll see later, I come a bit stuck on an insurmountable object. But nevertheless, I think it's still pretty good as a teardown, and it gives a chance as well to look at some of the fault finding that I, that I go about in order to identify various reusable and various hopeless parts of the circuit. But anyway, let's take a, a look at this. I mean, cosmetically, it doesn't look too bad. On the back, we've got a very disturbing sign, do not use, and it also says repair refused on the back here as well. So that's uh, slightly ominous. Let's uh, see if we would like to open now. Here we go. We're in. Okay, let's have a look at how it actually does its optical attenuation. So our top wire here, which is uh, this one at the back, this is an optical fiber and it runs into this side of this big black box. And at the other side, we have this second fiber. So the attenuator is in the middle. Now we can see pretty much straight away how it's going to do it because there is a stepper motor sitting on this end. And just here, we've got a bundle of wires that are vanishing off underneath, which I think we're going to find is going to be an optical sensor to detect when this is going to drive a carriage left and right in here. And uh, I think that's going to be an optical sensor to detect that. And this on the other side is another optical sensor. The micro can, microprocessor can move the carriage all one way, sense when it reaches a certain point, move it all the other way, sense when it means reach a certain point, that point, and it gets its two index points from that. Let's see if I can't find something that will open. I do just need to be cautious on here just to undo the screws relating to the case because there's some screws near the middle that I think might relate to mounting internally and uh, it would be bad to undo those. Okay, so the top is loose. Okay, so we can just see that these are just fiber optic patch cords. Um, I don't know if we've got a specification on them. I'm expecting them to be a quite a thick internal. And I can't see the specification. It's bound to be on there somewhere. Okay, let's lift this off carefully. Okay, so let me put this part to one side for a second. And in here, we can see our mechanism. So down here, we can see that there is a, if I turn that stepper motor, we can see there's a very fine stepper motor, probably 200 steps per turn, and it is moving this, which is a graduated glass kind of slice. So we can see that half of it is clear, and half of it on a diagonal is black. So as we slide that backwards and forwards, we change the amount of attenuating material that's in the way of the light path. So the light just slides shines from one side to the other. If we look at here, there we go. Light comes in one side and out the other. And if you look carefully at these, I don't know how much more I can zoom in. You can see they're actually forming a kind of lens on the end. So we've got a normal fiber patch cable going to a lens mechanism. So if we look on the bottom down here, we can see there's a little metal rod poking through. So what's that for? Well, on either end, there is a photo interrupter. So a photodiode and a, and a little transmitter, presumably at a frequency that doesn't interfere. And as I move this backwards, there we go, it's about there. And that little rod vanishes into the photo interrupter down there and uh, and that's it we're at full attenuation and if we actually continue just a little bit further we will be in black so in other words there is no light going through now i'm quite interested because these two are set it seems to me a reasonable amount wider than than that actual attenuating graduate filter 
So I'm interested to see whether these in fact actually focus the light inwards. So for that purpose, I can put a normal red LED light through it. And it's coming out of this side here, I think, yes. And we'll just put a little white token in there and just see how much that light spreads out. So it doesn't spread out at all. But hopefully we can kind of see just there Actually, what's happening with this is it is actually definitely focusing the light inwards so that uh, all of the light will actually go through this and not get attenuated by spreading out and bouncing around in here. So there we go, very, very simple indeed. We've got our inputs on the front panel and our output on the front panel. They go one side here, little lens to focus it through a graduate filter and out the other side and to the output. Driven by a stepper motor and a kind of linear, sort of set of linear rails to keep everything nice. It's got a very nice fine graduated um, <clears throat> thread on the inside. So based on what we've seen, let's see if we can't estimate the resolution of this device. So we've seen that roughly speaking, the graduate filter was about eight centimeters long. And I reckon there were at least three, three turns per centimetre. It might even have been four, to be honest. But anyway, let's say three turns on the, um, what would you call it? The drive shaft. Uh, so that's three. And the stepper motor is probably going to have 200 steps. So 200 or thereabouts. So eight times three times 200. Thank you, 4,800. So that's 4,800 turns to drive it along. Now, if we say that it's a zero to 60 dB, so that is 60 dBs divided by 4,800. Yeah, so that's fantastic. So look, that is a 0.0125 decibels per step. So that's a pretty precise piece of equipment. Obviously it needs calibrating and the calibration at either end will vary depending on the wavelength of light going through here. That's why this has a wavelength button so that we can uh, use the right lookup table. Okay, that's quite nice, look at that. And all of the plugs are different sizes, so I'm gonna pull this one off, I hope. Nice. If we look down here, photodyne, blah, 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 blah linear power supply so there we go okay so rather surprisingly there are actually two transformers here both connected to the mains and uh, they come out to their own bridge rectifiers and capacitors and things like that and i think the reason for that is that um, the motor circuit is high current and uh, the rest of it is much lower current and i think they're just trying to keep the uh, the two isolated so that we don't get the noise from the motor coming through onto the electronics so I've decided to do a capacitor replacement on this board. So I'm just making up a quick map of where they all are. That way I can take them all off at once, do my diode tests without the interference of the capacitors and uh, just replace the capacitors and the board should be up and running, fingers crossed. Take. So nothing as we'd expect, nothing as we'd expect. Turn it all around, yes, yes. Okay, on this side. Uh, this is the negative, so that and that, that's it. So this bridge rectifier appears to be absolutely fine, I think that's it. So that bridge rectifier is absolutely fine. I've got another bridge rectifier, ah. same model, just here, one, two, three, four. So essentially this is the minus 12 and this is the 12 volt regulator. Yeah, that's a 7812 and that's a 7912. Okay, so I have replaced all of the capacitors in this power supply circuit. So I've tested all of the diodes and the bridge rectifiers and replaced all of the capacitors because I wanted to recap it anyway. Okay, so I haven't got the actual main body of the thing connected up. I've only got the mains coming in 
the voltage selection switch. This is going off to a regulator, I see. This one's going off to a current sense. And uh, this one's going off to the switch. However, no dramatic result there. So let's have a look at these voltages over here then. So ground, five volts. So 4.975, I'm pretty happy with that. And ground, minus 12. Minus 12.4, pretty happy with that. Ground and 12. 12.1, yep, so I am very, very happy with the power supply. I think it is absolutely spot on. Cool, excellent. So I'm happy that power supply is up and running. So I've got, so what I'm doing is I'm just measuring the resistance on the various DC circuits elsewhere. So I've got 669, 670 ohms on the five volt. Difficult to read the 12 volt because it's got a lot of capacitance in it, but it seems to be about 5k. And the minus 12 seems to be incredibly high. Presumably it's just powering an op amp or something like that. Okay, so I'm not finding anything immediate that says do not plug this in. So hopefully you can see this. So I'm turning on and we're getting a one pretty much a one on the display here. And that's all we've got, minus one, and we've got a step, and a couple of other things just starting to uh, starting to come through. So with everything disassembled quite a lot more, I've taken the front panel off too, so I can gain access to the display board. So just here we've got the power supply board, and uh, yeah, quite a bit of smoothing capacitors and things like that, and uh, yeah, there's not a lot else there really. There is, a link going off here to a current sense resistor which is presumably safeguarding against the motor stalling and uh, there's a little trimmer on here just to uh, just to set that current sense um, but there we go that's all there is there's not much going on there at all and uh, the power just goes over here and onto this back plane but okay so we've got that and then we go here this first card is our microprocessing board so all the processing is done on there and then back here we've got another card which has basically got motor drivers on it the opto detection for the for the two ends of the attenuator track uh, also go into that board but i think that they just have a bit of amplification and then clean go through the back plane and into this processor board let's take a look and uh, at the processor board in a second but uh, over here we've got the display board so we've got a very large display on it and uh, so that's an LCD display uh, and it's seven segment display, lots of characters and a few enunciators and things like that. And then we've got two devices here driving that. These are ICM uh, 7123s, both the same. Uh, and these are just classic triplex drivers for LCD displays. So they take some signals in on this ribbon cable and uh, do all the logic and all the level shifting in order to do the, uh, the displays. This over here will just be some timing logic and things like that. Over here, we've got, this is just a buffer for the microprocessor data lines. And this one over here is MM74C923. So that IC just there is in fact a keyboard decoder. So it's a, a five times four uh, array of, of keypads that it can decode. So literally you press your keypad, it does all the logic, all the kind of anti-collision stuff and stuff like that, and just outputs a binary code onto the data bus to say what value was, what key did you press. This big guy just here is an inverter. This is an LPS 12-1-2. I think this is an 80 volt or it might be a 100 volt. It's something in that region output, so that's RMS, uh, from a 12 volt input, and it can drive two um, a double load of backlighting for the LCDs. But as we've seen, the LCD display isn't showing very much. I'll explore that in a little while. Let's get onto the processor board and take a close look at that. So here's our processing board, and in the center, we've got a 80C85A processor, so a typical processor. And uh, on the right hand side, we've got some logic, and we're off to our GPIB bus. So this is GPIB here and a couple of driver chips and things like that just here and a bit of 
uh, address switching in this one just here. On this side, we've got a bit of address decoding. So that's a 374HC373. Uh, These are all 74HC uh, series ICs, and most of them are just you know, glue logic, really. So at the bottom, we've got our EPROMs. So one, two, or A and B. What's troublesome is this one here is missing. And everywhere else that they've actually purposefully not populated something, they've actually written the word spare in it. There is no word spare written in there. And then we've got this one here without a label. So this is a bit concerning. My feeling is there should be a fully populated set of four EPROMs just here. And that's probably um, the root of our problem. Up here, we've got RAM. So I don't know the size of this RAM. Two RAM chips. A MK48Z02. And then we've got this device. So an AD567 is a 12-bit digital to analog converter. And that's why I kind of get a bit confused. Not because I don't know what a digital to analog converter is, but because I don't know what it's doing on this board. So digital to analog converter, and then op amp, op amp, op amp, op amp. And these aren't cheap op amps, these are LT1012s. So these are instrumentation style, good quality op amps there, four of them in a row. And then we go over to here, we've got a transistor, some unknown device here, which I think is an 8401. Um, I'm not really sure what that is. Maybe some sort of Schmidt trigger or something like that, so we can detect a, a, an edge. Or it may be some sort of, um, could be some sort of multiplexer switch or something. Don't really know. Could be more op amp type stuff. Then we've got another op amp just here. And this device over here is also an op amp. So that's a power op amp there. And just here, we've got an audio output. Below it, there's another analog output, which is a BNC connector. So I don't know what that's for. Uh, and if I look on the front panel, I can't see anything that it might indicate. So some of these would drive, some, some model of attenuator would drive things like external um, reflection devices. So you could, you could model different amount of reflection on your lines. You know, or they might sort of, for example, if there's modulation on the signal coming through, they might actually pick out and demodulate that. So that was my thought initially, but there were no sensors. There's absolutely no sensor in the optical chamber for that activity. The only two sensors are well buried out of the way of reflected light uh, and are interruption sensors. So yeah, I don't, I don't know what that's for. If you've got a manual and you can tell me, then please do. I'd be very interested to know. Okay, so I'm suspecting that this is going to be the root of our problem down here, this missing EEPROM. Now, so I can probe this pin here and I do see a digital signal on that. That is the output enable chip select will be decoding which one to pick. So if I come down two pins, yeah, I've got chip select. So that chip is trying to be used. So uh, no joy there, I'm afraid. So um, yeah, I'm definitely missing something very important just here. So I wouldn't worry too much about other stuff. So I could get an error that relates to this, for example, because the chances of that still having valid data in it are pretty slim. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, where does that kind of leave me? Because I have looked around for just manuals and things like this for this, and, and they're virtually non-existent. Um, so one option that I'm thinking about is that I might actually take this board out. If the rest of it is okay, then I might take this board out and actually put a new processor board in. Not one of these, but one built around perhaps a microcontroller or possibly even something as advanced as a Raspberry Pi, perhaps, because there's actually not that much going on here. We want to drive, we want a keypad that we can input some uh, attenuation on, or we want to sweep an attenuation over time, but that's just steps and dwell times. So it's not rocket science. And um, yeah, and we need to drive a stepper motor. So that's well within the remit of, of just a normal microchip or something like that. And uh, yeah, we'd like some communication with the outside world perhaps, but that could be serial port or a USB or an ethernet connection or something like that. 
And we've got plenty of room in here. Physically, we've got a lot of room to do something. I think that kind of feels like an option here, but it'd be useful, I think, then to just take a few uh, additional evaluations. I can't really do much with the motorboard without actually kind of progressing on a long way. So the motorboard is here, and basically there are four transistors driving our stepper motor, and it looks like there might actually be a... So buried down in here, PD62803P, which I'm gonna guess is a stepper motor driver. So I think that's it. We've just got our driver IC buried down there. We've got a couple of big um, resistors for the power supply, and we've got some transistors um, conveniently mounted over the side, which I think are just the, the power transistors for, the, for this. Not a lot I can do with that until I get some valid signals running through. If I'm going to build something of my own on this, then I'll have to take this out, trace through all the ground, all the back plane, and just understand how those signals pass through. But a big question that arises is whether this board here, which is the display board, um, is actually working okay. So we've got our two um, display controllers here. These are the ICM 7231s. Backlight wise then, so I'm not too worried about that. This is an LPS 12-1-2. So this is about 80 odd volts output RMS. Might be 100 volts, I can't remember. The dash two means it's capable of, of doing um, two lighting loads. So, um, so this is a big LCD, so it's gonna be two lighting loads. So we input 12 volts, it does an inversion and it outputs nearly 100 volts. On here, which is the output from the relay going to the inverter. I've got nothing. This is the input to the relay. There's my 12 volts I'm expecting. So I'm just gonna short that across. Let's see if we've got back light. We have not got back light. I'll put this down gently. There's our 100 volts roughly. So that inverter is definitely working. What is not working is the backlight. Okay, so that's uh, the first thing. We know the backlight isn't working. Okay, because my displays are really faint. So pin two has the display. So just here is pin two input. Now we know that we're getting E01 just about on the front screen. So we know that kind of this sort of works. Let's have a look at our signals on BP1, 2 and 3. And also we can have a look over here as well on these other sides. Okay, so here is an input on one of the address lines. So this is normal digital data, just coming in on these lines really. So now let's have a look at BP1, BP2. So these are the back planes. So there's our black plane, four different levels. So, so high, a long period of one third, then a bit on the bottom, then up again, a long period, then high, and then repeating. And that's what I'm getting on that one. And up a bit, yeah, and then down a lot. Yeah, and that, that's right, that's correct for that uh, pin. So what I'm seeing here is I'm measuring one of the segments and this is the all off signal. Okay, so this is segment B7 and uh, C7. That's an all on, so that should be a, you know, a bunch of stuff all, all turned on. One, one, two, so that is A5, G5 and D5. So this, receiving the code, so error zero, 01, plus a few enunciators. It's getting them successfully here. It's translating them successfully into outputs along here. It's passing it to the LCD and the LCD is not displaying them how we want them to be displayed. So, okay, this is the, uh, this is the keyboard system. So on the left, we've got one, two, three, four, five. These are the rows. And down here, column one, column two, column three, column four. There's a keyboard bounce mask here. Um, so we connect that essentially to a capacitor um, and that debounces the keypad. We've got output enable and data outs up 
here. So um, five lines of data outputs. So we can do uh, finally coded decimal between um, zero and for nothing pressed and uh, 1101. That's reading backwards, sorry. Um, and we've got a data available pin on pin 13. So that might be worth having a little look at. Yep, so the keypad reader is actually working. As I press buttons, I change the binary code. Super, right. So I was kind of wondering why we'd got this IC at all, because this is a uh, 74HC0244. So this is an 8-bit buffer, three-state buffer, going onto the data lines on the processor. And it's next to the keyboard device. So it seems that they've basically enabled the keyboard device permanently, and then that they're using this buffer to switch that on and off the data lines. So we've got an address decoder and yeah, we're just picking the buffer from time to time and reading what the, what the keypad has pressed. Except you don't need to do it because this has its own output enable and three state outputs. So why you do want to do that, I have no idea. So as a repair, this has kind of reached its end. So we're happy the power supply is all working, that's fine. The processor board is kind of working, but it's missing an entire EEPROM and therefore just outputting an error and doing nothing else. We don't know whether the motor switchboard is working, but it's not a huge drama whether it is working or not, to be perfectly honest. So what I'm thinking is that I'm going to do some work on this as a little project, because, you know, this is a, a precision piece of equipment over here, and why wouldn't I keep that and actually use this as what it's meant to be? The keypad is on a separate circuit board to this. So what I'm thinking of doing is putting this, this is an alphanumeric display, of course, into the window. Yep, so I think reclaim display, let's get that fitted. It fits very nicely, actually. Um, maybe I'll just give it a, a black surround just to make it look a little bit better. But basically, yeah, fits fine. So that board goes, this board goes, gets replaced with a Raspberry Pi network connection at the end. This board stays to power it all. And uh, yeah, Bob's your uncle, I reckon, in a few months' time when I get round to it. So I think that's going to be the plan, because I just really don't want to waste all of this optical side here. It'd be such a shame. I don't see why this can't be a fully functional system then, and then I can calibrate it and things like that in order to get that calibration good, but uh, I don't see why that should prove to be a huge problem and I suspect the linearity of this is very, very good indeed. I say linearity, it's, it's a linear wedge. So, so if a millimeter, let's say a millimeter is one, three dB, so half power. So one millimeter is half power, two millimeter is what? It's, it's, it's a quarter power. So that's our relationship with the position on the wedge. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I would like that to have been a full repair, but uh, not to be. But uh, at least we did get a pretty detailed teardown uh, and a look at some of the components on some of the boards as I tried to diagnose what was and wasn't working. It became pretty quickly evident that we weren't going to be doing a repair once we found that EEPROM was missing. Now, if there's any, it's going to take me months before I get round to doing a modification to this to take this board out and to take the display board out. I've got most of the parts I want. I'm just not going to get round to it for ages be honest and um, if in the meantime anyone does have the ability to just image those ROMs and send me uh, the images I can burn new ROMs and pop them in that isn't going to be a problem but uh, if not if they don't turn up in a few months time then I will press on with my intended modification and uh, if anyone's got anything else they think I should be doing to this while I'm doing that modification then please let me know anyway that's it for now I'll see you next time take care and don't forget, of course, to subscribe and like the video. Bye for now.